Welcome back to Data Architecture Day, sponsored by the Triangle Area SQL Server Users Group. We are now going to go over to our new screen with Lewis Davidson, who's going to talk to us about relational database design. So Lewis, take it away, please. Hey, that's me. All right, so let's get started here. Let's share my screen. So you don't have to see my cartoon chart. All right, so let's get started. I can hear myself, which is going to be really kind of cool. If you can hear you, it's not bothering you, it's not bothering me. But All right, so who am I? I've been in IT a really long time. I've written some books on database design. Presentation today is going to be a lot of what's in there. In fact, one of the main examples I'm going to use, I just rewrote again for my next version of the book. and. Not much has changed in database design uh, over the past 30 years, right? I mean, a lot of the things are very the same. What's really changed is that we can do a lot of the things that they came up with 30 some years ago better because of what has been done in the engine. My contact info is DRSQL, it's my Twitter, Con Twitter address, my email address is my 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 website address is drsql.org. The slides will be on there in the drsql.org slash presentations. Um, they'll be sending they'll have that available in a clickable link somewhere. My email is drsql drsql at hotmail.com. So if you want to ask questions about this in the future, please do. So there's a couple of reasons why we build databases. And the first is simply to put data, put data in and store it. Anybody can do this. We know this. Anybody can build a database. Lots of people do. And if you ever pulled out a notepad and started typing out things that you wanted to store uh, a, a list, that's a database, right? That's the most rudimentary version of a database. A piece of paper is a database. The boxes of papers you luckily can't see right now on the camera behind me, that's a database. The problem is the next thing we want to do with a database is do something with it. Like the first, like let's say the first thing you do is you want to store that someone takes an order, made someone make an order. Well, the next thing we want to do is we want to process the order, and then we want to get paid for that order. That's the easy part. Most companies are really good at that, and they could have done that just as well without a computer, without an electronic database. But as time passes, we want to also report on that data. We want to say a couple of years ago, we ordered, um, somebody ordered these products. Why did they order it? How do we get them to order some more? And then we want to know, you know, how do we get them to, to do other things? How do we get the next person who looks approximately like them to order another something in the same way? What gets more complicated over time is if you put something in a database or in a filing cabinet or somewhere, how do I find it 20 years from now? Because if we're going to put it in a data storage, how do I find it again? So the whole process, the whole reason we're building a database is A, to store data, and B, to find it and do some actions with it. The Getting the data in is easy. Finding out the, how to do what actions we can do with the data is more difficult. And the reason why we want to start out by doing trying to do the best job we possibly can. If you've heard of things like NoSQL and, and schemaless um, data storage, that's great. And there's, there's reasons to just say, I don't know what I'm going to do with this data later. Just throw it in a box. I've been going through some of my mother's old stuff. And you know, there's just reams of, of data. You look through that and you may find some bits of details that are cool. Oh, you know, back when I was a kid, I destroyed the neighbor's fence and my dad got a, law, a note from a lawyer. I found that bit of information where that happened. That's cool. But there's so much other junk in there. When we're building a proper database, we want to try to get rid of that, all those details, and be where we can say, find the bits and pieces that we want. So the reason we build a database, put data in, get real data out as easy as possible. So the first thing we want to do before we start building something, and this is really any kind of code you want to build or anything you do, is ask what kind of problem you're trying to solve. 
if you were asking about how to build a house, you want to build that house, you don't go to the realtor and say, I need a house. And he goes, okay. <laughs> he comes back for you. This person says, okay, here's your house. Here's your house choices. And you go, wait, no, I needed a house for, you know, uh, 12 people to live in. Oh, well, that's different. And then he comes back with a house with 12 people. And then you go, no, that, but I needed this. And then she comes back with another thing. And then, right, you don't do that. You go, they sit down at a table and you talk about all the different details. So you find out what do you want to store, store in this database? What do you want to get out of the database in the end? So we work through the problem. We, we sit down and say, what do you want out of this database? Ideally, it's not your job if you're the one designing the database to figure out what goes in it and why the person wants to do something with it. But someone needs to do that, and someone needs to agree that this is the problem. This is what we're trying to do. These are the requirements. I want to make sure that I can get out in a couple of years these details for an audit. Audit. I need to be able to delete people's data if they ask, but I also need to be able to handle if the government comes back and say, did you have, how many, how many customers did you have, et cetera, all these kind of things, all the kind of things that somebody wants. So we find out what the people want. We find out their requirements. And then we sit down and we go, okay, I want to build a database. And we want to make sure it works well and meets our needs and doesn't lie to us any more than we expect it to. What I mean by the lie to you more than expect you to is that we want to, number one, say, I know that, but I know that data I have on on myself lie is is a lie. After I've taken it, like I took my weight this morning, it has a certain number. Then I ate breakfast. That number's wrong, but it's as truth as I can get. And I'll take it again the next day. I'm not going to have a consistent value for that value. So that lie is an is an acceptable amount of of non truth. This testing stuff we're going through now with the the diseases. We know it's not as true as it can be, but it's as good as they can get, hopefully, right? We know it's as good as they can get, but we don't want to be able to go into the database and say, how, what's my weight? And it tell me 12 different answers or tell me the completely wrong, different, wrong answer because of the way you design the database. We also want to make sure we're using the right tool. If you're trying to store every single molecule of data, every web click on the planet in a SQL Server database, that may not be the right answer. SQL Server relational databases have a very, not narrow, but a very defined set of things they can do. They have a certain set of things that it, they're good for. I'm not gonna go into all those details or something you should really look into. And a great place to start to look into that is look at what Cod, a guy named Edgar Cod wrote a set of rules called Cod's Rules. There are these 13 rules that qualified what a relational database was. And they tell such things as what, why we have an online catalog, why I don't have to go look in some JSON file or XML files or, or directories and look at the C code and find out what a database, what tables look like. I go select from sys.tables. That tells me all the tables I've got. Select from sys.columns. It tells me the columns. Or information schema.columns. Um, it tells me the columns. It tells me why I go to a the, Select star from table name and select a stock and select a stack star from file name. It tells me why we have null values, it tells me why you have integrity values. It tells also these details that give you an idea of why you build databases the way you do. The things that you do as a programmer, if you're if you're a non-relational programmer, a procedural programmer, where you kind of get down to the, the core programming, you're really accessing the APIs of a, a programming language of, of Windows APIs to do things faster are the kind of things you need to divorce your mind from when you're doing relational programming because our goal is to divorce ourselves from the structures so we can let the people who are writing a relational engine um, grow that engine and do more with it over time. It's a reason why code that I wrote 20 years ago Without let, let's let's be more realistic. Back in 2005, they made some changes to SQL Server's engine. They have not made such considerable changes that most code you wrote back in 2005 could not still be ran in SQL Server without with just the tiniest amount of changes. Maybe super complicated code might have to be tweaked a little bit, 
but most of that code will still run as is just because all the, 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 the engine has changed tremendously. We have different ways it can run. We have different um, internals. They have new memory stuff, the new persistent memory modules, change how everything's are built. Even though the new in-memory OLTP um, data structures can, can work and the code can look almost exactly like it did many years ago just because of the way he outlined how things should work. And there's a whole set of books. I may have shown you a picture of one I would suggest as a good place to start, but textbooks, there's college classes, there's other books, great place to look. So that's kind of the things that I'm not gonna go any deeper into that. Obviously I only have 50 more minutes, so there's not too much I can say about the, the history. <clears throat> Excuse me. But there's a lot of there's a lot that went into why these things came up and why they did such a good job that this idea that they came up with 30 some years ago is still being used today and still being built on. All right, so now we know what our requirements are. Our customers said, "Hey, I want this, and I know how I want it." And we know they don't have it exactly right, but we know they have some idea, and they've we've actually validated with them that we they they have some idea what they're talking about. They're not completely out of their mind. We they 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 have thought about it. We're going to go through a, a design process which has three or four steps, if you will, and the first is called a conceptual model conceptual modeling step. And it's where we take their their con their idea and we look for the concepts that are in the in their in their in their requirements. So what are the things you're trying to model? Let's say we're doing a customer processing system. So we know we have customers, we know we have invoices, we know we have purchase orders, we know we have payments. And we find those big concepts that they have and we talk about how they're connected. An invoice is paid with a payment a payment is paid with a check or a um, credit card. So a payment, um, all those kind of things are then connected to one another. And you and you show how they, they work with each other. At that point, you review with the customer and you then build a logical model. So then you say a credit card is a credit card number and a credit card has details, the things that you need to have. You add and you start to dig down to what should I be capturing? What should I store? Should I should I, as a company that I am, store a credit card number? You know, what kind of security do I need? All the kind of details I need to ask. What, a, what about a customer? How do I identify a customer? How do I make sure I know about them? What are the predicates I know about their data? We'll go through each one of these steps along the way in a, in a full example as we go. Then we're gonna sit down and we're gonna write code. Once we have the, the requirements, the customer believes that they're, they're what we have, we're gonna sit down, we're gonna write a database. We're gonna build a database. Um, SQL tables, create table. Um, we're gonna create check constraints, um, primary keys, all that kind of stuff. And we're gonna put data in, we're gonna test it, we're gonna give it to the customer and make it happen. And then we're gonna to go to the maintenance and tuning phase. And this is where you've given it to the customer, they're using it, DBAs are out there. DBAs are, are finding hotspots, they're, you put, you thought there would be 100 customers, so the thing you ship to them is optimized for 100 customers, and they've put 100,000 customers in. And maybe they, maybe so that kind of thing, right? They're growing it. Anything they can do without altering the meaning of the system, they're growing the system to, to meet the need. So code is literally what you're doing as a developer. As a developer, you are optimizing for the things you expect people to do, the things you want the system to optimize. If, if, they, if your system has a select by, search by last names um, search field, search, yeah, first search field on the, on the, on the um, browser, you're gonna, you may have an index for that, but you may not have an index for a first name because you didn't, you didn't set that up. But they may have added that or they may search for that and they, so they may add indexes for that sort of thing. If they start adding unique indexes or things like that, that kind of changes the meaning of the system that may break the meaning of the system and you may uh, then should be going back and doing more requirements and, and looping back and iterating. So that's, that's where we're at. So, all right, so these, these things become data models. So we're gonna draw a picture for each one of these and kind of work through the process. 
So what does it mean to data model? It means to, to design and capture the semantic details of each one of these things. We want to capture the structures that we're trying to build, the meanings of those structures, the predicates, and some amount of documentation about them. What does this table mean? What, what, when we write customer, what do we mean? Because it doesn't always mean the same thing to the same people each time. Doesn't necessarily mean what we can implement because not everything you build can implement. I, I'm gonna, in one of my examples, in my example scenario, I'll have a, a, a requirement you cannot implement in database whatsoever. There'll be a graphical representation. We've all done flow charts for programming. If you've done any programming, you've probably done flow charts just for you know, trying to figure out how you get up and get your family or yourself to, 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 to school or you know, whatever. I mean, first, I got to go to the bathroom and got to go to here and brush my teeth and then do this. <clears throat> these days, you got to wash your hands like 17 times. So all these things you, you work through, you, you, you've done that. So this is kind of the same kind of thing. We're going to model out what the data looks like. And we're going to look at how they, how things look together so we can sit down with a customer and say, does this kind of meet your needs? Because the picture does kind of really help um, share a lot. With, with your customers. I picture sometimes you have like 100, 200 tables in a database. It gets a little complicated. So you'll make smaller versions of the pictures, but the pictures really are very useful. All right, so we have our, con now we're gonna start. Uh, we're gonna start our conceptual model. So we have our requirements and we, um, we understand what the requirements are. And we're gonna look through those requirements and we're gonna find the nouns. What are the things that someone is wanna store data about? And we're going to find out how they are related to one another. When that's done, we're going to test. So you go back through the model, go through the requirements, and say, can I do the things that I said I was going to do? So for example, we're going to take these little requirements, and we're going to walk through them, and we're going to say, can I, can I model these? So we're going to build a messaging system for conference attendees. Can you, you can send a message to everyone or one person. Messages can have multiple topics chosen from a fixed set of topics, but you can also create custom topics as well. No duplicate messages in the same hour, and that's implied, we'll say, to the same, to the same person, from the same person. No att attendees can be connected to other attendees, and messages must not include bad language or hate speech. And then, you know, the, that's the where the whole thing, the bad language or hate speech gets really complicated because – you know, one word is bad language in one context. It's it's a uh, anatomical discussion in another, and then one word with put a dollar sign in the right place, and it's not a bad word in the real world, but it's a bad word in discussion. So you may need either AI to do that, or you may need a person to just go through and say nope, or a voting system. So we may need to build something external to the database. All right, so we go through our requirements. We say a messaging system for conference attendees. So here I'm going to say that a conference attendee then gets classed down to a messaging user. So I've got an attendee. Well, there was an implied relationship, just to keep this really simple, between attendee and messaging user. So attendees have been set up to messaging user. So if you choose to be a, a part of the um, conference, we, we set you up, all the attendees, and this is where you get um, able to use the messaging system. You can send a message to everyone or one person. So this is the messaging message table. This is the messaging user table. <clears throat> the dot on the relationship goes to the child. The dashed line says it's a non-identifying relationship, which means that this, the primary key of this table, whatever it happens to be, is going to be a non-key, non-primary key attribute. So this is the messaging user um, can send a message or is sent a message. The diamond in this particular modeling language, IDEF1X, can is says it's optional. So it's optional that this messaging user is sent a message through an, is sent a message. <clears throat> so it's either sent to everybody or it's optionally sent to a single person. Messages get multiple topics chosen from a fixed set of topics, but you can create a custom topic as well. So since it can be sent multiple topics. It becomes a many to many because many topics can be for one message and one message can be for many topics. So we have a message topic table. Custom topic, um, that's going to be just a, a attribute of message topic, so we don't make that its own table. 
excuse me. No duplicate messages in the same hour. That's not really something that's going to be. A, that's more of a predicate than an object of itself. There's no new, new um, nouns in that table. Attendees can be connected to other attendees. So now we have a messaging system, and we have a many-to-many -many relationship between messaging system, messaging user, and user connection. You might think of this as a graph in later in the latest versions of SQL Server. I'm going to just go ahead and model it right now as a many-to-many, -many, um, <clears throat> as we do. But it could be implemented as a graph, and which would give you some additional information, like tell me how the people this person is related to. You might also think of this as a many-to-many. -many. Tell me all the people that they've messaged and that they're connected to. So it gets some interesting things you can do with many-to-many's. We're not going to get into that whatsoever today. Just Keep in mind that graphs and many-to-many -many relationships are very rich bits of data. You can start to mine information out from a model. And must not include bad language or hate speech. Okay, so we have our we have our design. If we were to start testing, we would just go back through, and it would be just exactly the reverse of what we did, except you would just highlight each step. Messaging system conference attendees. There's the conference attendee, et cetera. <clears throat> so we have our, our <clears throat> we have our conceptual model, and it's tables with relationships, and we again test. So once we're done with that, and we've reviewed with the customer, and they're happy with it, we're happy with it. They haven't gone, you know, wait a minute, we need this, we need that. We're happy with it. We sit down and we go, okay, let's do the logical model. And we want all the columns with their legal values and domains. So when I say that. Um, let's say you want to have the, the 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 user handle of a person of a messaging user. So like on Twitter, you can be what 20 characters. Mine is DRSQL. It can't be DRSQL and some emoji symbol. It can't be. There's certain characters that can't be in the handle itself. So we want to make sure it's not that. It can't be empty string. So there's no empty string. There's no at empty string out there. So we can't make sure it's empty string. It can't be null. So when you when you make these things. You might say it has to be at least three characters, and it's between three and 20 characters. So let's say you make it a, it's a it's a ver care 20 because it has to be an ASCII ASCII set of characters between three and 20 characters. If you just say it's, it has to be 20 characters, you're not really covering the fact that it has to be at least three. And if you trust like the an application to do the three characters, then what happens if you, somebody imports something from another direction? And we only they only put two characters. Or if you make it unlimited size, because maybe someday they make it 25 characters or 300 characters. But then you and somebody puts in 25 characters, right? We want to make sure we constrain our data at least in our in our logical model. We we want to write it down to where we say it's between three and 20 characters. And we want to try to make sure we, we constrain that the best we can at a database level. What about like uniqueness conditions? How do I identify one customer in my database. And we want to look at you know how do we do that naturally in the real world. If I say how do I how do you identify employees at your company? It's probably a, one of two or three ways. Like you have an employee number they gave you. And so when you would turn in your timesheet, you probably have to put your employee number on there or your login information or possibly your driver's license number for certain things. Maybe your social security number. Right? None of those things are things that you have, can have duplicates. You may have doubles of some of those things um, due to you know, identity theft, but nobody should have the same social security number in two different places. Some of those things are really bad things to use in terms of um, personal information that you would give, but they're all things you may, they may have on you for reasons that are valid, just things you shouldn't be using out in the real world. So we want to make sure that we have those things identified and things that they that they could actually legitimately have. And then we want to have those predicates. Like I said, if I have a driver's license number on you, I may also need to have the state of the driver's license number. So those two columns need to be filled in together. I need to be able to have, and if I have that, I may need to also have some other bit of information. And there's, if you've seen when you um, are, my friend, no, that's. Uh, um, so I right so all the kind of predicates that may surround bits of data that, that need to be set up. 
the key is we want to understand what's good data and what's not good data. As a, a person who designs relational databases and also does ETL, this is the big this is the big deal in work in life, is understanding what is not good data, because when you are writing reports and you find bad data and it's because three or four layers back in the whole process someone hasn't really identified what's bad data but the people that are looking at the data trying to make sense of it know it's bad data there's a real problem so if the data is good when it goes in it saves everybody all sorts of problems it doesn't really matter if you can implement this stuff it just matters that it's thought about someone's covered it okay and again, we test. And don't start to don't wait, don't wait to test when you've got code. Because it's easy to change a model. It's easy to change something written down on paper. Right? It's an, it's an eraser. It's a, a delete key. It's really simple. It's really hard to, to erase code after someone's written programs on it and written reports and you know upper upper management's using it and going, wait a minute, what does this mean? I don't understand what this is going on. Make sure you name things correctly. There's a lot of naming standards out there. Pick one that works. Um, English language is not a good example. Microsoft databases aren't exactly a good example. There's some good naming standards hidden in Microsoft stuff. As long as you pick one of them and not all of them, you'll find some variations. It's best to be very particular and always follow the exact same naming standard. Um, try to avoid abbreviations if you can. Um, for tables, I would suggest don't prefix them with TBL if you can avoid it. It just doesn't it doesn't make sense to cuss to, to users. Why do all the tables name TBL? I know it's a TBL. Um, would you name column COL? Why didn't you name the database DAT, right? Um, singular or plural? I didn't really name singular because the way you read the uh, IDF1X model is I have one table name row. I have two table name rows. Some people say it's plural because it names the name of the set. Either way, as long as you are consistent, it, it really makes sense. <coughs> Column naming is a little more complicated. Um, they should really be singular. All your columns should be singular. I don't want to foreshadow too much if I, as I don't know how far I'll get to the end, but all your columns should really be scalar, um, scalar atomic values that have just one single value in them. So they really should be singular values. Um, overly specific prefixes and suffixes, things that like tell you the data type that's in there really get kind of overly complicated, uh, particularly if you want to change the, the, the value from a Veracare 30 to a Veracare 40, and you've named it the name bar 30, and then you've got to change all the code, and you just go, now forget it, and then everybody's confused why it's 30, and but it says 40, or it's 40 and it says 30. So the standard format I've seen is what's theoretically based on ISO 1179, and it splits our names into parts, uh, role name, attribute, class word, and scale. The class word is a suffix that kind of identifies the usage of the column. In non-implementation non -implementation specific terms, I'll show you this in some examples in a second. And then you add an attribute that kind of tells you what, what part the name is playing in the, in the, um, uh, for the table. A role name is a very specific role it's playing <clears throat> as that attribute. And then scale is if it's not something that normal that you would expect. For example, let's say you have a name column in the table. It's the company name. Well, I know this is the company name. This is the name of the company. And I, I don't have any question what that is. If I see the company dot username column, I don't think that's the name of the company. I think that in this context, it's either the name of the username that I use to uh, attached to the company's system, or it's the name of the name that the company is attaching to my um, data, right? Excuse me. So administrator username, I know this is the administrator user I'm attaching to the, to the name. Uh, pledge amount. I know this is a, an amount. I use an amount of money. It's whether I'm using money data type or a numeric 1212 or whatever, it doesn't really matter as long as it's. A, a, I know it's a money value. Even if you're for some reason using 
string data types. Who knows why you would be doing that? But if it's stuck in there for some reason, um, if you don't know that it's a dollar value, you you put you're putting euros in there. That may be a, a thing. Um, in my databases, all the money is is dollars unless otherwise stated. A code is just a, a string value that's you know used to identify a code. It could be three characters, one character, 50 characters. All that matters is it's not a textual string, probably doesn't have spaces in it. It's not something you can read out and do something with it. Um, end date, save time, mail is here flagged. You know, it's not a Boolean, it's, it's just a little flag that tells you something's happened. Date doesn't have time, save time is a point in time that something occurs. It, all that really matters is you follow some naming standard that makes sense to you. All right, so we, we put together our logical model. I've gone through, I've added all the all the um all the columns I need. And I've not put data types here. I've put what a, what we're gonna call domains, and we've we've given them names. And these are the ideal versions of the database requirements. And it's not specific to any specific implementation. I've given documentation. This is a message table, it's short messages sent either to an entire group or um, to a single individual uh, message by the, the same text may only be sent once per hour. That's the predicate. We've, we've talked about how we're going to implement that, get deeper into that. Um, so the domains, I have topic name here and topic name there. So however we've implemented topic name, we know it'll be the same. We don't have different sizes of types or different rules that we're going to implement. Uh, we may have to use different things like check constraints or even triggers. God forbid, things are getting really deep. We have to use triggers. Uh, message text, I've said unformatted values less than or equal to 200 characters. So unformatted values may mean we're taking, you know, we may not let bold or um, any of that. We're just, it's just simple characters. <clears throat> Predicates may not be empty or null. So we don't want to, we don't want to let a message go through. It's just a single blank. We don't null values. And we have that hate speech thing in there. A surrogate key, we have the stand-in for the surrogate value. I'll talk more about surrogate keys here in a minute. Uh, the type of data is any. So it doesn't really matter how you implement your surrogate keys. Some people might use integer, integers, integers, integers. Some people may use GUIDs. I've actually built um, text values. You can pack a really large number of values into a small space by using um, a base what, 50, 62, 60 something, 64, right? Because you can 26, 26, A through Z, upper A through Z, lower, one through zero through nine. If you do that with case sensitive, right? If you really need the space, I, I don't suggest that as a norm, but there's any way you determine is the way that works best for you to implement it is, is, is available to you. Point in time to hour, so there's no data type in SQL Server that goes to the point in time and hour. So we're going to find a way to implement that um, in SQL. I don't think I actually build the implementation in this um, really in this in this <coughs> excuse me in this um, presentation. I'm getting my my um, work from last night mixed up. I, I've been over this presentation and I did some work on this. I, I have this very same example in my book. And I, I, I use a computed column to store the message time. And then I round it off and persist it and use that as part of the key. And that's how I make that happen. Um, relationships, you know, you document relationships. Even if you're working for a company, I usually ask when I'm in a group, uh, how many people here are allowing, I work for a company where they don't allow you to use foreign keys. And if there's, 30, 40, 50 people in the group. There may be one person occasionally sometimes that says they don't let us use foreign keys because they're slow. And I, I have, you know, I feel bad for the person because they do actually slow down your, you know, they do actually slow down your inserts uh, some because obviously they have to, right? It, it takes time to go and check to see if that data um, exists. They don't slow down as, as much as it does having to check every single time you fetch a value to see if the child row exists or see if the parent row exists like it's supposed to, but they certainly do slow things down a few milliseconds on every insert when you're um, 
going through and inserting rows. If you're inserting like billions of rows, it's certainly acceptable to disable them and turn them back on at the end of the process. But when you're doing onesies, twosies, it's certainly no necessary. Um, sometimes it's not possible to use a, a relationship you know, to implement a foreign key as you would expect. Because if you want to use a, like cascade operations, sometimes you can't do like cascading between two tables. You can't have two cascading relationships between the same table to another table. Like in this case, if I want to delete the messages, if I delete messaging user and I want to delete the messages and I want to set the null, set use set null on all the um, messaging use sent to messaging user IDs. I can't do that because it, ca it causes a, it says it causes a circular reference. So I can't do that. But in the logical model, it doesn't really make any difference. In the physical model, I may have to do that, maybe disable them for leave them there for documentation purposes and turn on a um, trigger, which is how I actually implement it and in, in when I do this example. So I one of the I saw I, I don't I'm not looking at the chat right now, but I saw someone talking about Joe in the chat. So the circuit keys, I'm a big fan of circuit keys on all my tables, particularly in the physical model. I even start in the, in the logical model. For a couple of reasons, one is for the whole PII kind of reason, where if I use some bit of personal information in here, like the user handle or you know the customer ID or some deal like that, if I put the user handle in here in the messaging user ID, every message would also have the user handle in the in the data, and every user handle then when every message topic would have the user handle in there. So if I had these bits of data split out, and I put this on one server and this on another server, I then have more personal information spread across. If I'm just using a surrogate, I don't have that. I mean, it's a little more work at that point where I have to do some joins. But when I'm trying to keep the, the proliferation of personal information from being spread out, it's, it's kind of helpful. It also means if I want to update this user handle, and this person sent thousands and thousands of, of messages, I then have to go update them and make changes. Here, I would never have to make any changes. However, in the in the modeling sense, it has some negatives in that this, whatever your surrogate key is, you have to be able to take whatever your natural keys are, whatever your alternate keys are, and replace it. So this surrogate key is a stand-in for user handle. So you paste your user handle, and really the key over here is user handle ID, user handle ID. Well, notice user handle ID is in part of the alternate key of this table. Well, so that needs to stand in for the message ID. That is part of the key of this table, which is part of the key of this table. And if this table was related to any other table, it would also be there. So part of the part of the difficulty in using surrogate keys is understanding the design and really getting an idea of what's going on with your with your normalization and your understanding of where things are going. So there's there's positive and there's negatives in terms of what happens with surrogates, but as long as you end up in the right place where you expect, and you don't have this kind of duplicated data and circular references, because a lot of times you might end up with someone who has a relationship between, say, a table like this and then another table like this, and it doesn't look so bad because you don't see messaging user ID in this table, but you do actually have messaging user in this table because it's a key in this table and it really is in here and it's really in here. So be really careful as you're, as you're modeling your tables as you get larger and larger models to understand what it is you're doing as you're following some advice on using surrogate keys and not really understanding what's happening all, all along the entire watchtower of things you're doing. All right, so now we've, we've got our, we got our logical model, we got our physical model. We're taking this, we're going to build our physical model. We're going to add schemas. Um, we're going to start turning this thing into a physical model. We're going to take schemas. We're going to segregate our tables into groupings, families for usage, security. I can grant select on a schema, and then every, every table that they have, every table that you add to that schema, they have access to. Um, every store procedure, you can grant them access. Um, some domains become tables. So like I said, attendee type, I mentioned earlier, I think with my, my mouse, it's still on pointer. 
Um, I have a 10D type here. This has a domain with a certain certain set of values that it can be. I'm not letting the user create these. So I may just make a table that's a simple domain. I'll leave the value as it is and make a table to the domain. I could have made a check constraint. I could say that I trust the front end to, ma to maintain that value. What I definitely do not want to have is an, an enum where it's the value is one, two, and three. And the only place that one, two, and three are defined is in an application. <clears throat> so I want to have it defined at least somewhere in a database, if at all possible. I've chosen the best data types, if at all possible. Um, we'll, we'll get back to that in a little bit. Um, I may have added some physical columns, like row create time, row last update time, maybe for ETL, maybe to tell me when, um, when that row is modified. So if someone says, something's changed, I may put the application name that's changed. I may use temporal tables um, to capture the history of changes. I may add triggers to capture history of just a column or something. There's all sorts of things you can do to the physical model without changing the meaning from the logical model. When we got to the end of the logical model, we had the requirements, we had the business rules that the customer wanted. We we don't want to we want to change that in the physical model. Now we just want to get it done and, and meet the requirements and make it work for the relational model. All right, so we have our data types. You know, we picked the right things. I've used um, Invercare when I needed to. I've used I put you know, I've, I've allowed Unicode in here, but formatting, I've said no formatting. I did leave these as, as Vercare um, inadvertently. I don't know how they got left. One thing I would say about that is in, um, in SQL Server 2019, you can now use Unicode in um, the 8-bit column, 8-bit um, um, character data column, 8-bit <laughs> character set column. <coughs> with uh, you can now add co collations to those character sets that it will allow UTF-8. So if you're using mostly um, mostly ASCII characters, it could be a, a boon to you, or especially if you already have lots of code already attached to them, so you don't have to change all your code. It may be best to make them in their care um, directly. All right, so now we're like at 20 minutes. Good. Okay, I'm doing okay. So now we say, are we finished done designing yet? Are we done to finish? Are we done finished designing yet? <laughs> I changed that earlier. That's that's our. Right. Are we done finished designing yet? That's my Tennessee, my Tennessee talk. You guys, I don't know if any of you guys went to the Andy. This is my Andy um, Leonard, my Andy Leonard um tribute. There. Are we done finished designing yet? Are we finished designing yet? Um, at this point, it's important to check. We want to check our, our data. Um, I love Andy, by the way. Against the standard. For the relational model, we're going to get into the normal forms. And what you do is you put your, you, you generate all that code, you build your database, and you press Control Y, Control R. Don't write this down, please. And you say, hey, what can I do? And it says, wow, this database you're trying to build is really bad. Doesn't make any sense. Wow, this is really, try, please redesign this and try executing the batch again. And then we realize that, no, they, they don't have this kind of AI yet. And the reason they don't have this AI yet is because they don't know the requirements. There may be an A12. There may be a custo. Those may actually be things. <clears throat> I mean, the best it could tell you is you've got an ID here and a key, and that seems to be out of order. You've got a Fred here, and Fred and a date may not make sense. There are some tools that could possibly tell you that. But it's really not going to tell you that you haven't designed well, you haven't normalized your database, and you don't even know what normalized is possibly. So let's let's get into that. So what is normalization? It's it's a process to shaping and strain our database to work with a relational engine. It's pretty much what we've done by going in and, and saying what are the individual concepts you've been modeling, and what are the details about that um, process. But it's 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 kind of codifying it and making it and really taking the time to look at it and make sure it works. It's specified as a series of forms. If you read about them and you get into the textbooks about them, it's really, really heady, mathy kind of stuff. And I, it really kind of did not make sense to me the first few times I got into it. 
But practically speaking, it's just a set of standards to work through along the way. And it's really done instinctively. If, if go back to that notepad example, if I set a, a child down and said, make a document that listed all of your toys, they would not start that document and just start writing without any punctuation, without any breaks until they got tired and then go back. And when they came back to the next day, they would just keep writing without break. They would eventually go, you know, I've written the word Lego green block a thousand times. Why don't I just write Lego green block and say, I've got a thousand of these things. This is really dumb, right? They wouldn't do it, right? They would, they would keep, they would start breaking things down. They would go, hey, that makes sense. Why am I doing this? So it's not that hard. And it's, it's, it's very instinctively. It's just the more you get into it, you've got to get details. And the details you have to work on are, are very re requirements oriented. And it's hard to understand the requirements because a lot of people that you're going to work with don't know what the requirements are trying to meet to start with. <clears throat> it's really important to understand, even if you aren't going to try to achieve them or cannot achieve them perfection. And it's utter nonsense. If you cannot understand the requirements because the requirements are all that matters. There's a thousand ways to model everything. I have a keyboard on my desk. There's a hundred ways to model this. It's either one keyboard. It's a keyboard and a, uh, I'm holding a, my um, wrist mat. It's a keyboard and each one of the keys individually, it really depends on the question you're answering and who's asking the question. Because it, for me, it makes sense it's one keyboard. I bought it in a box, it came as one box. But the people that put it together, it's a bunch of pieces. It's a bunch of pieces, right? It's a, it's a, a, it's a tremendous number of things that went into it. So it really depends on the uh, uh, point of view as to what it's doing. The main purpose of this normalization thing is to eliminate DML modification anomalies and partial column operations. What it means is anytime I want to update a piece of information, I update one piece of information and the entire piece of, piece of data and no other piece of data needs changing. So if I want to update Lewis in the database, I don't update Lewis and leave the rest of the column that says Davidson. I don't have to update Lewis in 17 different places. Think about when you move. <laughs> We're talking about moving in the next year. And I dread the, the, the process of having to go to every place that has my address and say, please change my address here, 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 here. It took me two years the last time I moved to finally get my address changed and all the places it's changed. It's been stored. That's kind of the pro what we're trying to avoid is I don't want to have to change. I only want to change it in one place in the database. So when I do a query, I, I want to look at um, this keyboard. I don't have to look in seven different places. I don't I, it's, I hope that makes sense. <laughs> I feel like I should go on a rant for the next 10 minutes on that. And it's focused around protecting the integrity of our data by making sure every column and table is an atomic unit and making every modification an atomic operation. Atomic means a single um, single thing at once. And this atom atomicity of operations is a big part of what makes relational databases important. And I said relaxational databases. I knew that there was a joke in that, and I forgot what the joke is from the last time I did this presentation. <laughs> atomicity. If you think about what um, atoms are in, in physics, if you have an atom at its highest point, that's as low as you can break it down and not have problems. There are things lower than atoms, right? We have quarks and protons and electrons. But when it's when it's as an, at an atom, it's it's a, a thing in and of itself. We can we can put it together with water and it's still it still holds itself together, breaking down to become something um, apart. If I take a person's name, uh, first name, and I store it in the database, that's okay. I don't need to break that down any farther. If I break it down any farther and I have L, O, U, and I, S, and I put those in separate things, they're meaningless by themselves. I need to put them all together to have meaning. So I want everything to have meaning in and of itself together without being broken down any farther. So in the first normal form, um, there's, we're going to tell, we're going to, we'll talk about two of the normal forms today. Hidden in the slides are several others. 
and they all have meaning um, if you if you take the time to look at them. I just don't have the time to, to mention them because I, I when I do this presentation, I kind of balance the the first half of the presentation really is more important than the normalization part um, because the normalization part really isn't as big because if you do the first part right, the this part's easiest. But um, breaking the shape, basic shaping of the data for the engine. Um, the, if you're doing a data warehouse, you're really going to also normalize your data to the first normal form in almost every case. Column values are atomic, meaning we don't have one comma two comma three and ever need to know what two is in and of itself. I may, you know, do a substring of the uh, give me all the people whose first name starts with L O U. That's okay, but I don't want to find you know all the values that have two in them in the comma two comma one in, in a list. No duplicate rows. I don't have rows that have all the exact same data in them because that doesn't that doesn't make any sense. Every every row means something different, and all rows represent the same number of values. Uh, generally means no repeating groups. I don't have payment one, payment two, payment three, payment four on the same row. If it's a, if it if it means something different, it should have its own data. It should have its own column. It's kind of like the column values are atomic. You have one comma two comma three, and someone thinks, oh well, I'll just make you know payment one, payment two comma payment three, and then no, nope, that's not the way. You end up making another table out of it. So for example, I have a table of mascots. Um, so we have Smokey, Smokey, Smokey. I, I have this mascot ID, but it really is that surrogate key we were talking about. It doesn't have any meaning. It's just a random generated number. I can't tell them apart. So I need to find data that has some meaning beyond that. And I need to have data that actually means something to the user. I could put a key on name and color here, and it would be a perfectly acceptable table. And it would be a perfectly acceptable table, except now the user wouldn't actually be able to tell the difference. Um, black, brown, black, white, smoky, and brown, those are not things that really make a difference. Now I can say, oh, yes, I want to know the name, smoky, UT, that's the table I'm looking at. That's what I'm trying to find. Um, part of testing is, a uh, good, good part of testing is to actually sit down with your data and, and say, how much data could I throw into the table such that it would be confusing to the user so they're not like, so the tester would have to figure out what's going on. All right, so another example of, oh, and then on the little squiggly lines, I mean, put a, put a constraint on there. Make sure that no one can actually accidentally put in smoky UT, smoky UT a thousand times. Um, so the next example is I've got a I've got a database of books. So I want to store information about books. And they build a database like this. So you know what's wrong with this table? Well, can a book have more than one publisher? Possibly, but let's can a book have more than one title? I mean maybe. But can a book have more than one author? Absolutely. So that's a definite, you know, we, we can say that I, I've seen that many times. I've worked on a book with 50 authors. Um, users, I, I love how users work. I, I think users are the greatest thing ever because they solve problems the way they, they solve problems. They come up with an answer because they have, people say, you know, programming would be great without users, which is the, you know, kind of the dumbest thing you can say because without users, you wouldn't, we wouldn't be programming. <clears throat> but they 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 get stuck behind one of your, one of our designs. I'm not immune to do, do this and have done this have done this recently in times because you they, you know they, they don't communicate. I don't communicate requirements. People don't give you good requirements, but they find a way to solve the problem. For example, this is my favorite solution I've ever seen. So they want to add another author. Uh, they find a way to take the natural key and just append something to it. So now I've got five books, but really I have four books. That was my favorite. If you have this author, maybe it's a text and not a real pointer to a table, they maybe put a column delimited list. And you think, well, this is an integer, so it's a foreign key. I can't do this. 
well, they found a maybe they find a column that's not a foreign key. Maybe it's the extra column or the middle name column that no one uses, and they put the extra authors in there. And then they tell you that when you're writing a report, go out to the middle name column and grab the value. Users do fun stuff, and they misspell things. Programmers do this repeating group thing, and they put author one, author two, author three, which does solve the problem except when you then need to add more details. Now, when I, if I add more table, if I add a table, <coughs> now I add a user, add another, um, <coughs> excuse me, another author, easy peasy. And I understand this all seems really simple, right? Because these are very high level, simple, um, simple scenarios. Real scenarios are much more contrived, much less contrived, much more, much more to the point, but they're the very same thing. They're just less, less obvious. One thing you'll notice about a, a well-designed table is that you can always find attributes to put to them, and all the attributes you add will fit very nicely. I can add the type of contribution of the author very easily to this table. If I added the contribution type of the author to the previous table, even if I only had one author, it would have felt funny. So I'm going to add this extra table of author, book author, in the middle of the tables. One example I have of something horrible I had to do is we had a table that had email one, email two, email three. And so I had, had an email one status, email one type, email one private flag, et cetera, et cetera. It happens. It's really terrible. Um, this is where I, this is the situation where I'm talking about where you have the multiple the um, multiple parts of a name, you know, how do you search for parts of a name? How do I search for people with a last name? And these are very contrived, perfectly aligned names with no um, spaces, just first name and last name. What happens if you don't have a first name, you don't have a last name, you have a middle name? Um, gets more, um, gets more complicated. It is not, a, it's not wrong if occasionally you have to search for partial names. Totally okay. okay. It's no problem whatsoever. It's just you shouldn't make that a, a common thing. It's very common that people are looking for the last part of a name. Maybe find a way to make that make that more pop, more, make that more prevalent. See how you can answer their questions. Do something in the applications to watch what people are doing. Um, you can use um, computed columns to give them that formatted name. Even give it, even add a column that's a formatted name, which is defaulted to this concatenation, and let them override it because there's there's reasons to have a formatted name available that can be overridden. All right, so third and fourth voice code normal form, second, third, and fourth normal form. Basically, what we're looking at here, and I only have a few minutes left, is we're looking for the fact that all of our attributes are either a properly defined key or fully dependent on a key. So if our, all of our columns in our table are, are properly defined keys, so there's something that you use to identify some row in that table, or the columns describe the thing that the table is modeling, it's great. So if you look at a table and you see something like this, X is the primary key, I can know from knowing the primary key, if I know the value of 1, I know that Y is 1 and Z is 2. For 2, I know 2 is 2 and, two and Y is 4. But if I look at y, I notice a pattern that every time y is a certain value, z is the same value. So for 2, it's 4. For 2, it's 4. That's where you're looking for these kind of problems, both as the entire table or partial table. So if I have a table such as this, I have driver and car style, and these are the things that I want to know about them. Well, I look at the information. If I want to say the, Lewis likes to drive station wagons, and here's details about Lewis driving a station wagon, well, these attributes don't go against Lewis driving station wagons. This are attributes about the driver. This is about me, not about the, that. And this is about the station wagon, hopefully, because I don't think I ever got that high. <laughs> I was pretty big, wasn't that big? Okay. Sorry, the wrong button. Hopefully this is clear. I can't see any of your faces. I don't know if anybody's <laughs> phasing out or. <laughs>
I only have two minutes, so I'm going to scoot on. So the idea is we break tables down until everything that's in the table is something about the table itself. Otherwise, when we go to make a, a change, we go back to here. If I was to change the hair, the, the eye color here, I'd have to change it here. And things get out of out of whack. All right. So last thing I'll say, can you can you overnormalize? So probably people have heard normal denormalization and overnormalization. There's no real way to overnormalize exactly. It's more about over engineering. If a customer needs to be able to have multiple email addresses and multiple addresses, and if you need to be able to break an, an, an account, an address down to all of its constituent parts to meet the government's requirements that you save a $10,000 on mailing, or if you need to be able to store, you know, a hundred of something, any, any bit of detail, anything the customer needs is, is, is worth doing. The customer doesn't need to do it. It's not worth doing. And that's the, the kind of thing I'm, I'm, I want to make clear. If the customer didn't need to know that eye color or the hair color or the max weight of the vehicle, then what you've done there is not pop, improperly normalized. You've over-engineered. You've added data that they didn't need. So that wasn't over normalizing to make those three tables. That was just doing work that you didn't need. So you can't over normalize. You can bake tables that don't do what the customer wants. All right. And denormalization is you some of the some of the things I've said where you can't um, you can't make it go fast and you have to do too many joins and there's too many things. And so you go ahead and back off of that. That's great, but not knowing what it, normalization is, not knowing what good design is, is not the normalization, right? And then test. Test, test, test. Test, 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 test. If you have questions, I will certainly answer them at Twitter, um, email. We do have a couple of questions that should be fairly fast and one one which may take a little bit of time. So I'll definitely do the two that are uh, short. First one is, what would constitute an identical email address? Like what if two emails only differ by one character? Then they're different. Easy answer. Uh, so what if the key, you going back a little bit, uh, you picked, say, something like employee ID as a choice of a primary key, as a surrogate key. Is a surrogate needed for something that is a fairly simple table? A surrogate's never needed. <clears throat> it's just something that makes implementation easier. Because if you use the employee ID and it changes, and you've put that value in 100,000 rows, you've got to update 100,000 rows. You never have to update a surrogate key. In fact, if you use an identity value, you can you can never update a surrogate key, right? So, yeah, it's, that's that's the idea. You, the idea is not putting personal information is the is the really the to me the best sell for a surrogate for a surrogate key value. Uh, and here's one that hopefully you'll be able to give an answer to. How does the process of database design change if we tell you you'll be working with a group of programmers who will want to store and retrieve data efficiently from the database for their tasks, but they don't really know yet what they're going to store, and they're always going to be changing their targets through the development lifecycle? I mean, could I create a database schema and structure and some sort of procedures that help the team and won't be completely inefficient with a constantly evolving data design? Um, is there a nice way of saying this? I mean, I don't know what you're asking. That, to me, that does not sound like a good use of a relational database in some respects. I mean, can, you can store JSON or XML in SQL Server, and you can make a bunch of columns that are unknown value, unknown value, right? But 
that gets complicated. And the, 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 the true value in a relational database is highly structuring it and knowing what the value is and being able to index it and search on it. <clears throat> That's, that kind of goes back to the original slide of the hammer. And I have a hammer and I know what I can do with a hammer. And I would consider using something else I don't exactly, it would, I guess a lot would depend on the size and scale, but that to me sounds like a, a possible use of a different kind of data structure. What, what do you think on that? I think it's a yeah. complicated question that has a decent answer that we're not going to have time to get to today. <laughs> yeah, I would, I would love to see your answer to that too. All right. Well, uh, as we are just a little bit over time, I want to say thank you so much, Lois, for your talk today. Thank you. And if you want to follow up with any further questions, email address, website, Twitter handle, right on the screen. So with that, we're going to take a brief break. I heard our next presenter coming in, knocking on the door, um, figuratively speaking. So we'll be on in just a couple more minutes. And as always with these, I'm going to Turn off the stream, it'll turn back on, so stick with us. <laughs>